Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irene. I'm the host here. And my guest today is Anakin Alice. Hi, Anakin. Hello, Irina. Nice to see you. Nice to see you on my channel. Love that show. It's like, I love that color. It's like beautiful pink. Well, yes. I wanted to ask you, I looked at your Ravelry and I saw 685 designs published there. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's like world record. Ravelry should check that. <laughs> <laughs> In my opinion, it should be a world record. How do you manage to be that prolific? Like, tell me about how you design. Um, well, I started designing about 15 years ago, and when uh, before Ravelry was even around. And when Ravelry was first around, um, when I first joined Ravelry, I felt like I had to get all my previous designs up there. So the first few designs I designed, I wish I'd never actually listed on Ravelry because the patterns aren't available anymore. But once you put it up on Ravelry, you can't actually remove it. Uh, you can remove the actual pattern, but you can't remove the listing. So I wish some of the earlier ones weren't there because I don't really like them anymore. Um, but because when I started 15 years ago, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, I just thought I've been knitting a long time. This sounds like fun, let's go for it. Um, you know, what have I got to lose kind of thing. Um, but I used to, well, I still do. I started designing a lot for magazines. And when you design for magazines, you very quickly get into this almost like a treadmill, if you like. I don't mean that in a negative way, but where you have like deadline after deadline after deadline. Um, so you you kind of rack up the number of designs quite quickly. And I do have sample knitters as well. Um, so I don't do all the knitting myself. I mean, I have to write all the patterns and come up with ideas and that kind of stuff. But I do have sample knitters. So I don't actually knit all the samples myself um, because I don't think I could knit up any designs in, in 15 years. Um, and, there's, and I do actually have a few designs um, that are not on there because some of the stuff I design for magazines and books and yarn companies, if they don't put them on, sometimes I forget to do it. So I know there's probably at least five or six, maybe as many as 10 um, that aren't actually on there that I need to actually list. But sometimes I just don't get time to do stuff that's in magazines and books and that kind of thing. But I've designed for loads of magazines over the years. I've designed, designed for loads of young companies. I've contributed to uh, quite a few books. I've written a couple of books of my own. I've got all my self-published patterns. So yeah, they, they kind of rack up all, over time. <laughs> Accumulated, yeah. Well, let's go back to your childhood. Yeah, I grew up in Norway. Um, which obviously got very rich knitting right. culture and knitting history. So do you remember learning how to knit? No, um, I remember always kind of being able to knit. The first thing I remember knitting, I was probably a teenager, but I think I knew, but I knew how to knit before then. I asked my mum quite a few years ago because I, I kept being asked, you know, when did you learn to knit? And I quite frankly have no idea. So I asked my mum and she can't remember it either. I think because she was knitting all the time, she just said that I just started knitting. Um, I mean, she made it sound like I just kind of picked up needles one day and started knitting, which I'm sure is not true. But uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know when I learned to knit. I don't remember learning to knit. My mum doesn't remember teaching me to knit. But I think because she was always knitting, um, I think that's probably why I don't remember it because it wasn't such a big thing because she was always knitting so I must have just picked it up and had a go I guess but the first thing I remember knitting I was probably in my early teens I think and it was a pair of really hideous red and white socks and I hated them. <laughs> well do you remember what kind of things your mom was knitting? Yeah I mean she was knitting a lot of sweaters um, Growing up in Norway, you know, you need, it was cold, so you need warm clothes. So a lot of sweaters for me and my sister, wool sweaters, socks, hats, gloves, scarves, um, the kind of thing that you, things that you need to wear in a cold um, climate. Um, things like uh, knitted kind of uh, leggings to wear under our snowsuits in the winter when we were little kids and that kind of thing. Um, but probably mostly sweaters, I think. Right. So was lace your way of rebellion against all the traditional <laughs> Norway knitting? <laughs> um, 
I don't know. I hadn't actually done any lace knitting. So when I lived in Norway, I never actually did any lace knitting. Um, I did a lot of color work and that kind of thing, the traditional Norwegian knitting. But when I, I, I gave up knitting for a while when I first moved to the UK. So I moved to England um, when I was 20 and probably for about 10 years or so. Um, I didn't actually do much knitting because I couldn't read English knitting patterns. Um, so when I took up knitting again about 15 years ago, I um, started just doing very simple things. And then I happened to, I, I don't know, I can't remember exactly why, but I think I picked up like knitting magazines. I got some American magazines like Vogue Knitting and I saw lace patterns and I thought they look really beautiful, but I'd never done any lace knitting before. And then um, a new book came out by a British author called, a uh, British designer called Jane Sowerby. Um, and it was called Victorian Lace Knitting Today or something. Yeah, I think it's Victorian Lace Knitting Today. I should have double checked, but I forgot. Um, but I had that, um, as a, I asked for that as a Christmas present um, and when it was first published. And that was the book that really made me um, get absolutely hooked on lace knitting. I only knitted two shawls from that book. It's a big book and it's got, um, she's got, she goes through uh, Victorian lace patterns and then kind of translates them into like a more up-to-date version. And I, I only knitted two book, shawls from there. Actually. You have? Yeah, it, like, it's an absolutely beautiful book. And that was yeah. the book that made me kind of get into lace knitting and actually learn the techniques and realize that I could do lace knitting because I didn't think I had the skills to do it. Well, let's talk about you getting into designing career because it's one thing mm. to be able to follow other people's pattern. It's not, it's even this, you know, even to need something that you're improvising, but to write it down and to publish it, like talk about your first designs and that whole process of learning how to become a designer. Well, I never actually liked following knitting patterns. Um, I'm the same way with things like cooking. I don't actually like following other people's instructions. I like to just do it. So even as a teenager, I remember I knitted a couple of sweaters and things without a pattern. I just kind of made it up as I, I went along. And when I get back into knitting, that's what I started doing because I couldn't understand English knitting patterns. I just made stuff up. And I started with very simple things like scarves, um, and I also made loads of bags. I made loads of felted bags. So I was hoping I could like make, design them, make them and sell them at craft fairs and stuff uh, till I realized how little people are willing to pay for handmade items. <laughs> and then I gave up on that idea. So um, I then decided I really need to try and learn to write patterns. And as I was only just getting my head around reading a pattern in English, trying to write a pattern in English was quite challenging because they're written in quite a different way than I was used to from Norwegian patterns. Um, but I just kind of jumped in. I tend to not overthink things too much. I think to just like jump in with both feet first and and kind of sink or swim. And my earlier patterns, I found some when I was having a clear out a couple of years ago, I found some of my earliest patterns and they are really, really badly written <laughs> because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, these days there are loads of resources for people who want to get into designing. There's loads of books, there's um, stuff on YouTube, stuff on the internet, there's blog posts, there's groups, you know, in um, groups and Ravelry and other places that you can get a lot of information from and learn how to design and how to write patterns. When I started, I didn't really have any of that because the internet was still, you know, fairly early, um, you know, before Ravelry and things like that. So I really had no resources at all. Um, so I just had to go. And then got better as I as I went along. You know, I learned a lot when I started working with magazines. I then learned a lot because I got feedback from their editors right. on what was wrong with my patterns, basically. <laughs> well, was it difficult for you to learn? Because it's one thing to just produce a scarf with lacy pattern on it. You have all kinds of shapes and and garments and shawls and everything like on earth in lacy patterns was it difficult for you to learn how to design like certain shapes certain sizing like grading of the patterns all of that 
Yes, um, I started with very simple things. So the first pattern I had published was actually a pair of socks and I just kind of had like a basic pattern for like a very basic plain sock. And then I just added a lace pattern to it. So I just had to figure out how to make the lace pattern kind of transition from the leg to the foot and work out with the shaping and the stitch count. So I kept it very, very simple. And then I um, had a go at doing some like rectangular scarves and shawls because obviously they're rectangles so they're fairly easy and then I remember I spent ages trying to work out how to do a top-down triangular shawl with the center spine because they were really really popular at the time mm -hmm. and I could not work out how to do them so in the end I actually bought a book um, which I can't remember what it was called but it was a very small book which had like basic recipes for top-down triangular shawls with the center spine and I did used to buy a lot of books because it was a good thing to flick through books and see how patterns were, um, how things were designed, how you achieved certain shapes. Um, and I kind of established gradually over time, kind of like certain um, almost templates for certain shawl shapes. And then you just have to kind of slot the stitch pattern into that. And to start with, that was quite difficult and it would take me a lot of time. But now I have so you know I have set templates. I know how to make the stitch pattern repeat, for example, repeat throughout the shawl. Um, so it's a lot easier now, but it was quite challenging to start with. And when it comes to garments, trying to do all the different sizing and stuff for a garment, I I really had no idea what I was doing when I started. I started off designing some socks and shawls because they were easy, because you don't have to worry too much about 100 percent you know, correct size and things. And then I decided that to be taken seriously as a designer, I had to design garments. I thought all proper knitwear designers design sweaters and cardigans and things. So I submitted a design to a magazine I was already working for, for a, a sweater for a teenager, because I thought I don't have to do too many sizes. And I just managed to find, I think online somewhere, a list of different sizes. Uh, measurements and stuff of different sizes and then I wrote it all out in a notebook so I worked out all the maths for each size in a notebook and then I knitted the sample and then my tension was slightly off um, and I had to change all the maths so I had to go through all my numbers and change it all by hand in a notebook which was a huge amount of work and I thought I can't do this this is not sustainable so that what actually made me um, uh, learn how to use uh, spreadsheets like Excel. And then uh, with the help of a blog post I found, I managed to set up an Excel spreadsheet. I also got my kids who were at primary school, uh, which is elementary school at the time, to help me um, set up a spreadsheet because <laughs> they knew more about it than I did at the time. Right. Right. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you something. So at some point I was toying with the idea of like learning how to design and I ask you a bunch of questions and immediately you provided me like the whole wealth of information, places to look at, like things to try, softwares that you use. Like it was like really, and we didn't even talk much at that point. It was just like sort of we just met and you were like so ready to help out. Were you finding like the knitting community as helpful when you were searching for knowledge? Um, yes, I didn't know that many designers when I started, um, but uh, just when I was sort of starting to submit to magazines, someone locally where I live actually introduced me to another um, knitwear designer who lived locally, and she was already established and designing for quite a few of the British knitting magazines, and um, a joint friend um, introduced us, and she helped me get in touch with a lot of the uh, knitting magazine editors in the UK to kind of gave me a foot in the door. So I think thanks to her, I managed to get in touch with some of the editors because I was a little bit nervous about emailing them. And she really encouraged me and said, just go for it. Um, and that really kind of encouraged me. Um, I think when it comes to reaching out to people I've met online, I was a little bit cautious because I was a bit worried that um, people would think that I was just trying to steal all their knowledge and secrets kind of thing. Um, and I was also a bit shy, so I was a little bit kind of nervous about this approaching people online and asking them. But there was starting to become, once I started designing for magazines and stuff, there was 
starting to become more kind of uh, resources available online. And once the Ravelry started, there was then designer groups and Ravelry and things like that. So then information became easier to get hold of. But I've always kind of tried to be helpful when people ask me. Um, you can kind of tell someone's um, intention and attitude. I've had some people stop me when I've been doing, uh, when I've been having a store at shows and stuff, at knitting festivals, come and looked at my yarn and then started asking me questions. And that I don't like because it's difficult because I'm there to sell my stuff and, you know, I can't spend half an hour answering questions. But if somebody reached out to me, especially if it's somebody who was, I'd already been chatting with a bit and somebody reached out to me online, then I would always try and be helpful because, you know, there's, there's plenty of room. There's, you know, enough for all of us. Um, it's much easier to get started if you have somebody who can at least point you in the right direction um, or where to go and where to find information on what to do. Um, and I think if you are, you know, if you just say no and you're a bit rude and unpleasant, then that word goes around as well. And people realize, you know, that kind of rumor gets around the knitting community quite quickly, I think. So I think, you know, being nice and helpful and, you know, I wish I'd had more people that I could have reached out to when I started because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so if somebody asks me, then I'm usually happy to transfer. It depends on, you know, how busy I am at the time, where it is, what I'm doing. Um, sometimes people might send me a message and it's at a, in a period where I'm really, really busy and I just haven't got the time to reply. Whereas if somebody messages me, when I've got plenty of time, then I might provide a more um, in-depth answer, if you like. Okay. It just depends on what time of year it is, because, I mean, knitting season is really autumn and winter. So during autumn and winter, especially the autumn from like September to Christmas, I'm usually so busy that anyone who approaches me is likely to just get ignored. <laughs> <laughs> well, you plan your whole year in advance. Like, do you now have already the entire year 2022 planned of like what's going to be published when and what you're designing first and next? No, I've never been very good at like planning out what when I'm going to release certain patterns. I tend to work on a design, um, knit up the sample, write the pattern, send it off to my technical editor. And when the pattern is ready, I tend to release it. Um, I probably should plan a bit more ahead. Um, I kind of try and juggle my own self-published patterns with the patterns I do for magazines and yarn companies. And last autumn, I was really busy doing a lot of designs for magazines, uh, which will be published sort of throughout the winter and spring. And also, um, I was approached by a couple of yarn companies I haven't worked for before doing designs for them. So over the last few months, I haven't had as much time to work on my own self-published designs. So I've probably got like four or five on the go that have kind of stalled because I've just run out of time to work on them uh, because of deadline stuff. So um, I kind of, I'm, while I'm juggling doing self-published designs and magazine and young company work, I'm a bit reluctant to kind of, kind of set up a plan or a schedule for releasing my own patterns because if an editor suddenly commissions a design for a magazine, usually they have fairly short deadlines and then I want to say yes to that and then everything else gets kind of pushed back. So I kind of, I have a few things that I want to do this year, but I haven't got like a specific plan or a specific schedule. Yeah. Um, I got like one pattern I started working on over Christmas and as in, I did like that much of it. Um, which I would, would like to release, which I originally wanted to try and release by the end of January, because it's very much a winter design, but there's no way that I'm going to get there. So I'm probably going to have to push that off till next autumn. Um, yeah, I, I find planning ahead too far a bit difficult. What do you see as difference, like for you personally, between when you're writing a pattern for magazine and when you're self-publishing the pattern? Like, what do you enjoy in both cases? Well, for a magazine, so magazines will typically send out um, a kind of, um, some kind of um, inspiration type thing. So they'll send out a thing with maybe 
photos or the type of designs they're looking for or, or like a theme or like a color story or something like that so you have something to work from and then you submit ideas and then they may or may not commission one or two or more ideas you know this depends um so once i've then said yes to it i have to kind of stick to that so if i submit a design for a certain type of sweater with a specific stitch pattern i have to actually produce that sample and write that pattern when I have my, when I design for my own pattern line, sometimes I might start out with a certain idea and then I don't like it or I change my mind or I decide to do something else or I decide to put that design on hold and start working on something else. So I have a lot more freedom when I work for my own patterns because I decide. And that can be quite nice because if I change my mind, I can just go in a different direction. But it can also be a problem because you don't have the structure of deadlines. I find I very much need a structure of deadlines. If I have a deadline, I will get stuff done. If I don't have a deadline, I don't always get it done. And self-imposed deadlines don't work for me. So I'm very good at working to deadlines. Um, but yeah, so I find it's kind of easier to get stuff done for magazines and yarn companies and stuff because I have to, because if I've said I'm going to finish something by a certain time it has to get done and it has to be what they expect me right. to produce so I can't change my mind along the way unless I really think there's a good reason to change my mind then I can always contact the editor and say look this original idea isn't going to work I'm going to have to change this little detail or whatever um, but I can't decide I'm going to produce a present shawl and then decide I'm going to suddenly do a rectangular shawl or something because they might be expecting a present shawl so I, you know, it's a bit more. Do those deadlines stress you out ever? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so whereas I do kind of thrive on deadlines, um, if I have too many of them, it can stress me out. So at this moment, I've actually got two deadlines next week and one the week after. Two of them are being knitted by my sample knitters and they're actually already done. So the two that are being done by my sample knit is actually finished. I just need to block them and kind of finish them off and post them. Uh, but the one that I'm knitting myself is not done. And at the moment I have um, a week to knit the front and the sleeves of a sweater. <laughs> and um, yeah, it is stressed. It does stress me out at times. It depends. Um, I've had times when I've had the yarn arrive after the deadline. So I had a time when I was designing for an American magazine and the yarn took too long to get here because the yarn company shipped it, I think, by normal post rather than using a courier. And it was a short deadline anyway, but the yarn actually arrived after the deadline. So the magazine said, just get it to, you, to us as quickly as you can. So I knitted a chunky sweater in a week it took about five days i think and that was very stressful because i felt like i had to keep going because i had to finish it and there's also been times when i've been sitting up till two in the morning i remember once i knitted this huge circular shawl for a magazine and i was blocking it at two in the morning um because i've been sitting up half the night trying to finish it because i had to post it by the end of that working day so um I blocked it about two in the morning, went to bed and then just hoped it'd be dry enough by the <laughs> afternoon so I could get in the post. So yeah, deadlines do stress me out sometimes. Um, sometimes I kind of feel like I need a bit of a break from it, um, but it just depends on what else is going on. And um, I do a lot of workshops as well. I teach a lot of workshops. So if I got a lot of workshops and a lot of design deadlines all mixed together, then that's when things get very, very stressful. Um, but on the whole, I quite like deadlines. I'd never get anything done if I didn't have deadlines. Right. Well, I want to ask you about your, so you are into essential oils. How is that? I see some behind you? me. <laughs> right, right. And I see a lot of posts when you like talk about like, this is going to help with the inspiration and this is helps with calming me down. And like, this is for today's mood how like how did that became a thing in your life um i think it was about four years ago um i'd kind of been i'd used them before a uh, long long time ago 
Um, but for, I think it's about four years ago, somebody I followed on Instagram was using uh, essential oils and was posting about it. And I kind of thought, oh, I'll try that. And at the time I was feeling really tired and sluggish. Um, I have a problem with my thyroid. So sometimes I go through periods where I feel really, really tired. And at that time I was really struggling. Um, so I bought some and tried them and I found that they helped to kind of uh, wake me up a bit when you know when I had to power through deadlines so it just depends I mean I usually have them diffusing I think different blends and different um, oils combined some can be very calming and relaxing some can be more like uplifting and like wake you up a bit peppermint for example if I'm feeling really tired and I have to get a pattern finished or I have to get some work finished or I'll quite often um some peppermint in my diffuser or just take a few drop in my hand and take a few deep breaths and it helps to just kind of wake me up a bit um and they um the company i use they also do blends that for specific reasons so they have a blend um that's called inspiration blend and it's supposed to inspire you so when i'm working on creative stuff i try and use that in the hope that it will help me just get a bit more inspiration and things like that so you also have I mean, I feel like you're a person of so many things going on in your life at the same time. So you're the founder of Facebook group, Lace, Love of Lace Knitting, right? What's the Yeah, right? yeah. Love of, Lace. Love of Lace Knitting, yeah. So that you started also about four years ago. And I love that group because it's just like, I find it very inspiring place because every time I'm like searching for ideas, I pop there and there is like 70 beautiful ideas right there. And mm. the, you, you collected some of the like most skilled lace knitters of the world in that group. And it's like really nice to mm. meet people mm. who have the same obsession as I do. Um, you also have a YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel you started with just techniques and like how to fix the mistakes. And now it's suddenly grown into a blog, a vlog, and you're sharing like much more than you did at the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you, like how all of these things, how do you decide to start another thing and another thing when you have the most cramped schedule on the planet already? <laughs> um, I don't know, because when I first started, when I first started designing, I also started a blog. Um, at the time, I didn't really know anything about blogs, but I discovered some knitting blogs and I thought that looks like fun. So I set up a blog and for years I was actually blogging, you know, three or four times a week. And then a few years ago, when I started getting really into social media, I think it was mainly when I started using Instagram, um, I kind of gradually got into blogging less and less. I just didn't feel like writing longer posts, I guess. Um, and that's one thing I found is that I can't focus on too many things at the time. So if I'm really into one thing, another area tends to suffer a little bit because, I mean, there's only so many hours in a day. But like, for example, with my YouTube channel, I started it just as a place to be able to upload tutorials when I felt like doing them. Um, and that's all I used it for was tutorials. And sometimes I would go through periods where I would do one a week. Sometimes I would do one and then not post anything for months. <laughs> you know, it just depends on what I had time to do. And then as I became more comfortable with um, video and recording myself and especially editing my own videos, and listening to my own voice, because to start with listening to my own voice when I had to edit the videos was like torture. I hated <laughs> listening to my own voice or watching the videos and recording them. So uh, as I became more comfortable with that, I kind of started enjoying doing videos a lot more and um, decided that I would try and post a bit more. So a few years ago, probably about three years ago, maybe I thought, right, I'm going to start posting more on YouTube. And I probably did a couple of videos and then things got really busy and I didn't post anything for months. And then at the start of the pandemic, um, because all my workshops got cancelled and, you know, a lot of the stuff that was going on outside the home got cancelled. Um, so I started posting a bit more regularly, but it was still a bit kind of as and when I had time. And then I think it was really like last autumn that I thought I managed to post more consistently for a while, um, uh, like post regular uh, 
podcast blog style, style videos and that kind of thing that I decided that right I'm going to try and become a bit more intentional about this so I did blogtober last October and posted I didn't post every day but I posted several times a week the short videos and then I did vlogmas um I didn't post every day but I posted quite a lot and then for this year I've actually decided now to post a video every single week on a set day um and mix it up with I'm going to do a mixture of tutorials and reviews of various yarns and knitting products so I've already done a few yarn reviews so when I've used the yarn for a design for a magazine or something I will quite often before I send a sample off I'll quite often record a little video just give my thoughts on what I thought about the yarn especially if it's a new yarn that I haven't worked with before so I've been trying to do a bit more of that and then um talking about earlier about um but I kind of plan things out for the year I have actually kind of set myself like a schedule for YouTube to try and be a bit more organized so I'm going to post um every other week it'll be like a podcast blog type episode and then uh, once a month it'll be a tutorial once a month it'll be like a yarn review or product review of some kind so I'm going to try and stick to that and see how well I do with that but um I'm trying to kind of be a bit more intentional about what stuff I do because I used to just kind of think well I fancy doing that for a long time I fancied having a Facebook group but I was a bit nervous about starting one up in case nobody joined yeah. um I thought I don't want to have a face group group where it's just me <laughs> <laughs> so I was like I'm being an eye bad for ages and then I um had a chat with uh, Kathy who's the uh, moderator who helps me out helps me run the Facebook group and she said well I'll help you moderate it if you like I'll you know so I thought right well let's go for it then because if I have somebody back up so when I go through periods where I'm really busy I've got somebody else who can keep an eye on things because not just Facebook group but any kind of online group if you don't keep an eye on things you know somebody posts the wrong thing things can get out of hand very very quickly do you um, ever feel like so you, you were like a kindergarten teacher in the group because like I had that yesterday this was my experience when somebody posted so we organized the group called knitters gonna knit where like basically we don't discriminate against other types of fiber arts either because many people do like multiple fiber arts so we try yeah, to yeah. keep mostly knitting but like occasionally somebody is going to be like oh and this is what i did with crochet so yesterday somebody asked the question like is crochet forbidden and suddenly there was like a zillion of opinions and it got catty like really like really fast like within minutes there were like 20 comments where like people were just like snarky and I I wrote the reply and I said we don't discriminate against other fiber arts we're not going to remove an occasional crochet project we will remove snarky comments and I felt like I was this like kindergarten teacher where like please don't fight right yeah Do you yeah. feel like that part of running a group yeah, I mean, that's the not so pleasant part of running a group. I haven't had too much of a problem with that kind of stuff in my group. Main problem I've had is people, I try and um, not allow people to post things just to promote their own businesses every, you know, every single day. I put up a post every Friday where people can post about their businesses. And then if people want to find out what the other people are after, they can go and look in that thread. It's a post that goes live every Friday morning. Okay. Um, because I don't want people joining just to promote their own stuff, especially because I'm a designer and I have my own yarn um, website I don't sell a huge amount of yarn but a little bit and I sell my own patterns I don't want somebody else to come in and just like spam people all day um so I'm quite strict on that and I have I used to be quite polite if somebody posted something on the you know posted promoting their yarn business or their pattern designs or whatever on the wrong day I would just like send my message saying you know can you please post this in, on the Friday and blah 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 but now especially if it's somebody I don't recognize somebody who's just joined a group if it's somebody who's like been a regular and whose name I recognize and they've been a regular for a while I'd, I'd send them a message but if it's somebody who's just joined and they just immediately start posting stuff about what they sell yeah. um then I now I just remove it and then if they keep doing it I just remove them from the from the group so my tolerance levels have <laughs> dropped a lot 
you know, I don't want to spend my time babysitting a right. bunch of adults in the Facebook group. You know, if people want to chat about knitting, that's great. If they want to um, have an argument, then there's plenty of Facebook groups where they can go and do that. Right. Um, so I, I, I must admit, I'm a bit tougher now, but it is difficult because, you know, it's not nice to have to tell people off. You know, we're all, well, most people in these groups are adults. We should all know how to behave. But the topic of knitting versus crochet, I don't know why some knitters get so angry about crochet, but it seems it's something that really stirs up some debate. And I don't quite understand why, but. Well, I wanted to ask you about the whole self-promotion side of business right so you have a youtube channel you have a group mm. you have your designs so you obviously want to promote that is it difficult how like how can people help you promote all those things because i feel like there is this whole lack of knowledge in the general population as to how they can help like designers or in yeah, brand yeah. dyers or YouTubers even to help us grow the channel, right? Or yeah, or there is <clears throat> resentment that like, oh, this is a money making thing for you. Why should I help you? Mm. And I find like this, uh, this especially with YouTube, right? Or or with Facebook groups, it's like it's as easy as just subscribing or liking a video or sharing that video with somebody else mm. or like being part of the group like it doesn't take necessarily money to support somebody or in case of designs if you just click like on the design it brings it up on Ravelry if you save it yeah. in yeah. favorites it brings it up on Ravelry so you don't necessarily have to buy every pattern no. that designer you like publishes to help the designer like, do you yeah. try to educate people about how they can help you? Um, probably not enough, but <laughs> I've started on YouTube. I've kind of started becoming a bit bolder now. So I do actually at the beginning and end of each video, I do say, you know, please like it or please give the video a thumbs up if you like it please leave a comment and please subscribe if you haven't already and that kind of stuff and then um so i've become a bit more kind of bold on youtube but to start with that felt really strange to say you know please subscribe uh, but i have started asking people and i did find that once i started actually asking people my subscriber numbers started to increase uh, so i've still got very very low subscriber numbers because i haven't really been putting a lot of effort into it until very recently but once i started being more intentional and actually asking people to subscribe people did start subscribing more so i kind of um i kind of took a bit of the fear of asking because i mean we all fear well most of us probably fear re rejection so you don't want people to kind of think well she's asking me to subscribe so therefore i won't you know i'll unsubscribe um I've subscribed to YouTube channels that I've been watching. Um, if somebody says, oh, please subscribe, I've thought, oh yeah, I haven't subscribed yet, I'll subscribe. Because um, yeah. I mean, it's not a binding thing. If you subscribe to a channel or you join a Facebook group or you follow somebody on Instagram, if in the future you decide you don't like it, you can just unsubscribe or unfollow or leave the group or whatever. It's not a lifelong binding, you know, we're tied together for life kind of thing. You know, you can, enjoy that thing for as long as you enjoy it and then you can decide to leave or you know unfollow or whatever well with um, specifically there is like an interesting thing that i find because people think like if they're going to subscribe they're going to be bombarded with every video you produce but they don't necessarily have to watch any of your videos they by subscribing to you they helping the algorithm to promote your video to other people who might be interested so it's like exactly. it's that like strange uh, relationship where the, it's not necessarily f they subscribing to watch everything you made, which like they mm. can, but they don't have to. But by just subscribing, they're helping you to spread it to other people who might be interested. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I subscribe to a lot of channels on YouTube, some knitting ones, some other things that I'm interested in. And um, I go on YouTube quite a lot at the moment, um, but quite often when I sit down to knit, I'll open my YouTube app and I'll scroll through what 
videos have been uploaded out of the channels that I subscribe to. And then I'll watch the ones I want to watch, some I want to watch, but I haven't got time to watch it. So I might start watching it and then watch a bit more later. Um, but I'll watch the ones that I want to watch. And there are some channels I subscribe to that I don't actually watch that often, either because I don't have time or because not everything they upload interests me. So I don't necessarily want to watch every video they upload. Um, whereas there are other channels where I do watch every video they upload. So it just depends on what kind of content people upload as well. But just because you've subscribed to somebody doesn't mean you have to watch every video they upload. Uh, you can choose not to go on YouTube. And it's the same thing on Facebook. Um, if you enjoy a group, but you find that people post too often, so your feed is full of posts from that group, then you can decide to take a break from that group or um, I mean, even just like friending somebody on Facebook, like on the personal level, um, you know, if you are friends with somebody on Facebook and they post all the time and you find that every time you go on Facebook, you see half a dozen posts from that single person, you can decide to unfriend them or hide their posts and things oh, like that. Um, for a bit. <laughs> you know, but I mean, going back to how you can kind of help people like promote them, you know, without buying, just things like, um, you know, if you subscribe to my newsletter, for example, and I release a new pattern and you think, well, yeah, that's a nice pattern, but I don't want to buy it at the moment, or I don't want to knit it at the moment, just like sharing it. If you have YouTube, uh, not YouTube, so if you have Twitter or Instagram, you can just share it and say, well, I've seen this pattern, you know, that I quite like, but you know, I thought I'd just let you know kind of thing. It's just, or just telling your knitting friends about somebody or, you know, just like we do with other areas of life. And, you know, if I find a product that I like and a friend is talking about needing something, you know, I might say, well, I bought this thing the other day and it's really good. You know, you might want to think about that. And I think it's just talking about the people that we like to buy from and whose things we like. Just talking about it, liking their posts on social media, um, sharing their posts subscribing to their newsletter all that kind of stuff it all helps um because well, there is a, there are a lot of designers it can be difficult sometimes you do feel like you're a small fish in a very big sea and that nobody's seeing what you're doing because there are a lot of designers now but there's also a lot of niches so you know somebody will see what you do <laughs> balance each other out well i yeah. want to ask you last question you have so much on your plate like a any given time do you ever feel despair do you ever feel like i just why am i doing this i just want to quit it all and not do any of that and how do you deal with that how do you keep positive how you continue yeah so um good example is probably when i wrote my books i've written two books and the first one my deadline was six months and it took like a month for the first yarn to start arriving so then I was down to like five months I ended up actually having to ask for a month's extension so it took me six months to write the book and it had 25 patterns I didn't I knitted one of those patterns all the rest were done by um, sample knitters um, but just writing all the patterns and all the technique stuff and all that kind of stuff was a full-time job but at the same time I was also teaching a lot of workshops so um when you got that kind of really intense, you know, I had a lot of workshops that I'd booked in, some of them involved traveling, uh, like an overnight stay, and then I was trying to write all these patterns, and I was trying to answer questions from all the sample knitters, I was trying to juggle ordering yarn for the book, and sending it out to sample knitters, and blocking the things that came back, and it was incredibly stressful, um, but I think while I'm doing it, I'm actually okay, because I just have to keep going. Uh, because I have this deadline and I have these commitments and you just have to keep going because if I stop and think about it for too long I will just kind of panic and think I can't do this you know um, so while I'm doing it it's not actually so bad but it's when you finish it when I posted that parcel with the 25 samples um, that's when I kind of realized that I actually overdone it and writing a book in six months was just crazy uh, because I was absolutely exhausted luckily it was in the summer which is when I tend to teach less so I had time to take a little bit of time off and that's how things tend to work out so obviously things have been different in the last few years because of the pandemic uh, because we've had months of lockdown and things so um, but normally my autumn and winter 
are very, very busy, especially autumn. But then summers are a lot quieter. So in the summers, I tend to kind of recharge and recover a bit. And then in the autumn, I mean, a normal autumn pre-pandemic, I was teaching every single week. And quite often I was teaching every single weekend and sometimes during the week as well. Um, and it is a lot to keep on top of. But I'm in a position now where my kids have grown up and they've left home. Well, one's a university, so she's home occasionally, but I haven't got kids at home anymore. Um, you know, I've got a husband um, who's been working from home for a while now, um, and I have a dog, but I don't have kids to juggle and all that kind of stuff, which obviously adds to a lot of stress, I think. I think once my kids went to university and I didn't have to think about all their stuff, things became a lot easier because I just had to juggle my own stuff and not juggle their stuff as well. <laughs> Well, I'm so happy that you agreed to be on my channel and we're going to put the links to your YouTube channel, your Facebook group and Instagram and all and Ravelry and all that stuff. So hopefully people can, people that haven't found you yet, yeah. gonna find you and join and support you in the ways that they can. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's been really lovely to chat to you. I know we've been trying to do this for a while, so I'm glad we finally managed to get it to work. I mean, that's the problem, I think, for the last couple of years with the whole pandemic and um, things, things have been difficult for the last few years. I think a lot of creative people have found it really difficult to kind of keep going, or a lot of people who run their own businesses, I found it difficult to keep going in the last few years because with all the uncertainty, um you know like all my workshops got cancelled I, I was really really busy february and march two years ago and then suddenly i had nothing for months where i didn't teach a single workshop um so it's been difficult i think for the last couple of years and i was um i think trying to keep going like normal and running your business like normal in a pandemic has been quite difficult and um i feel like i'm really just not starting to get back into it again at, at the start of the pandemic I actually completely lost the will to design I didn't actually design anything for probably the first couple of months because I just felt like paralyzed like I don't know what to do uh, but I feel like I'm kind of getting back into the groove of things now um, but yeah it's difficult to plan ahead and you know do your normal thing when there's so much uncertainty in the world and stuff like that but hopefully we're coming out of it soon <laughs> and, and you know what the thing that i've learned this pandemic that you have to adjust and you have to basically see the positive in that as well because it gave us a little bit more time at home with, with yeah all that we love yeah. and like it brought us closer to the online community as well yeah, I mean, that's the thing. If I was doing the amount of teaching I normally do in an autumn, because autumn term normally is absolutely crazy. I'm just so busy. If I'd done all that, I wouldn't have time, had time to do as much on YouTube as I have. So because I was teaching less last autumn, I had more time to spend on creating YouTube videos, yeah. um, which was good. Um, I mean, I was teaching quite a lot last autumn, but a lot less than I used to do. Um, because I was trying to avoid traveling too fast. I was just teaching locally. Um, but it gave me time to focus a bit more on YouTube. So, you know, it's there are advantages as well. But <laughs> and I also managed to create some new online courses during the pandemic, which I wouldn't have had time otherwise. So, you know, you just got to go with the flow and change when the world change, I guess. Right. Well, thank you so much for being my guest today. And, you know, we'll put everything under this video description. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.